I digress. <laughs> After all, in the final analysis, for the most part, in a word, in any event, and in either case, not to mention, and to say nothing of by the same token. On the other hand, be that as it may, notwithstanding, to put it differently, in other words, that is to say, with this in mind, surprisingly, notably to be sure, in light of, conversely, nevertheless, as can be seen at the present time, in due time, to begin with, without delay. Now, uh, what was that? Okay, <laughs> if, you, if you know, what's, what's good about it is that you found it humorous. Because uh, if you didn't, I would have to come up with a new beginning for this entire thing. But the point is that I was starting with phrases that we recognize as being closings, phrases that are endings, phrases that are transitions to endings, every single one of them. That's what Haydn does a lot. Not in all his music, of course, he wrote a huge amount of music, but in a few string quartets especially, and in some symphonies, he tends to play around with structure, assuming that you can tell that he's starting in the wrong place. Sometimes it's very obvious. Uh, let's listen to, uh, well, before we do, here's a little Shakespeare. <laughs> thank you, thank you, that's a digression. Uh, the whole thing will be digressions, interruptions, and backwards, but you'll, the piece works this very well this way. Here's a uh, Dogberry, the, the character Dogberry from uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Marry, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruths. Secondarily, they are slanders. Sixth, and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have very uh, verified unjust things, and to conclude, they are lying knaves. So here's a guy who can't help but put everything in the wrong order. He obviously doesn't know what thirdly, uh, and et cetera, means. Now, let's hear a Haydn opening that is not this one that we're going to hear. Let's, let's take a look at the opening to Opus 76. OK. Is that OK with you? OK. So Opus 76, number five, here's the very, very opening of that piece, just the very opening. Yeah, fourth movement, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's the opening. <laughs> All right, it's funny, isn't it? Now here, could you play the ending of that movement? Yes, he did add those two chords at the end, but it's exactly the same. Now, here is the opening of Opus 74, just a little bit of it, the first movement of Opus 74, number one. Also Haydn. Okay, now. Thank you. I'm pretending to interrupt you. Uh, they only had another bar. Um, that's a strange one, because it, it, it starts with an ending. It would be much funnier, let's try this, if the first chord, which we don't know how long the first chord is, it has a fermata over it. Why did Haydn put a fermata over the first chord? I mean, it already gives you a sense uh, of ending, because it's, a, it's an ending chord, but also how long is it? Let's make it much longer, and so long, long enough that it's disturbing. <laughs> uh. Good. <laughs> now it feels like it's really over, but we haven't started. And you know, there are probably people in the audience uh, at that time who found that humorous, or people who were totally confused, which is humorous for the musicians and the composer. Um, <laughs> Haydn had in his home two posters that he, that he bought that are quite famous posters. One is called uh, The Audience Laughing, and the other one is called, uh, no, it's called um, The Audience at a Comedy, and the other one is At a Tragedy. And it's the same audience, more or less. It's a painting. Um, it's kind of a cartoonish painting. And in, in the laughing one, there's a speaker up in the corner at a pulpit, and he's you know, in the middle of something, and they're all laughing, and they're just falling all over the place, and they're, they're also talking to each other, and other things are going on. And in the corner 
on the podium. It says, selected uh, selections from Peter Pindar, Don Quixote, and Tristram Shandy. Those are the things that will be read. Now, Peter Pindar was a close friend of Haydn's. He, was a, he wrote funny poems that not everybody thought were funny. They were uh, sarcastic little poems. And he was a friend of Haydn's, which is already interesting that he was friends with that kind of humorous, sarcastic writer. Uh, Don Quixote also, ref Haydn took that personally because when he went to England, he played a piece called Don Quixote that he did not write, but he was happy to play it, and uh, a song. And then Tristram Shandy, of course, is by Lawrence Stern. And now, Lawrence Stern was an author who uh, was a contemporary of Haydn's, was often compared to Haydn, and Haydn was often compared to Stern. I mentioned him last year, so I hope you remember that. Um, and the thing about Stern is that uh, he also had this sense of comic detachment, a little bit of um, self-consciousness, deliberateness, like he would interfere with what he's writing by reminding you that he's writing it and get in the way of it, which was, he didn't invent that, but he took it much further. And Haydn, musically speaking, you could say he invented that because the few composers who did it before him, we never play anymore and the music's not very good and they're just a handful of people trying this sort of thing. Um, I looked up some of these pieces to be sure and they are terrible. So, um, now about endings before we hear a few more and beginnings. We see this a lot in our time in weird ways. The idea of starting something and already having a problem immediately. That's a comic thing. Um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, I don't know if you remember that movie or ever saw it, but if, uh, or are embarrassed that I'm mentioning it, it doesn't matter. But Monty Python and the Holy Grail begins with credits rolling, with a certain kind of dramatic music, and on the bottom of the credits, it looks like subtitles in Swedish. <laughs> it's fake Swedish, and the subtitles are about a moose, and you could read them in English, and uh, gradually, the subtitles overwhelm the screen, and it goes, you know, it stops, and they start all over, and they start maybe five times. The Each time the credits get worse, and there's always a problem with the moose, and eventually the people who are doing the moose thing take over the opening of the movie. And at one point, they the took a screenshot from the film. It says, the directors of the firm hired to continue the credits after the other people had been sacked wish it to be known that they have just been sacked. The credits have been completed in an entirely different style at great expense and at the last minute. And then the credits continue and they're terrible. Um, that's a very Haydn-esque kind of thing to do. And another popular culture thing from a long time ago, the most Haydn-esque television imaginable was George Burns. Now, if, if you know what I'm talking about, fine, but I'll explain what I mean. George Burns had a very, very dry sense of humor that was so dry that a lot of people didn't think he was funny, or people could tell that he was funny, but they weren't sure why. And um, to me, he was just like Haydn, not as brilliant, but that's okay. <laughs> and I'll give you one example. Well, two. <laughs> His television show had a, usually a kind of boring script, They're kind of cute, but he was not always in the show. He'd walk outside of the show and apologize for the script or say, look, this is getting out of hand, and he walked in and fixed it. He was outside of the show. Then, as it went on in its eighth year, he went upstairs in the show, and he was watching the show on television. <laughs> with, I mean, it, it was bizarre. And so you'd be watching this kind of mediocre sitcom, and upstairs he's watching it and thinking, oh, I've got to do something to make this better. And he'd go down and introduce a problem to make the story better, then go upstairs and watch that. <laughs> and in the most famous one, uh, the most Haydn one I've ever seen, uh, he, it's about the opening night of the George Burns show, and Gracie Allen has invited a bunch of strangers to go see it, and he's invited critics, and they're going back and forth trying to figure out which house to watch it in. And that's all that happens. They never watch it. It never starts. And at the end, one of the critics says, you know, I don't know if this show's any good, but what happened here just now, that should be a show. <laughs> and the other critic says, nobody would believe this. <laughs> now, it's too long. That's half an hour. It should have been a five-minute joke. But it's, it's a very Haydn-esque joke. Now, um, the most famous joke is the joke. In other words, the most famous Haydn joke is, is the quartet called The Joke. Let's hear a little bit of The Joke. This is the end of The Joke. I have to, um, don't raise your hand because it's embarrassing, but um, blink if you know this piece. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> okay. 
Let's hear it. Isn't that hilarious? Now, it's particularly funny, but it's also the most obvious joke he ever told, which is why it got the nickname The Joke. He does things like this all the time, but they're usually more subtle. Um, uh, a, a word or two from some other people about this sort of thing, about beginnings and endings. Since when are the first and last line of any poem where the poem begins and ends? Asks Seamus Haney. It's a good question. Uh, Ethan Kanan's most recent novel, big novel called uh, A Doubter's Almanac, begins with a very dramatic scene, stops, and then starts many, many, many years before that scene. And that scene appears on page 442 again. Now that's a little bit like in some movies, you know, where you see the beginning and it moves backwards because it's very cinematic. In a novel, it's, it could be more disoriented. But this tradition goes, goes very far back. In literature, it's very old, but in music, it starts with Haydn, as I said. And Haydn, in a way, therefore, in a very real way, was the first comic composer. Because there was humor in music before Haydn, but it was almost always with words, or about a situation, or it was from an opera, or uh, it was just light and charming, and it wasn't actually funny. But Haydn was funny. So, let's hear the actual opening of the piece we're going to listen to. This is Opus 51, number one, which is already a hilarious title. That's sarcasm. <laughs> OK, that's all we need for now. <laughs> now, unlike the joke, you're not laughing yet. But it's strange. And I'll tell you what's strange about it is that it starts with a, a, an ending. That is an ending. Um, harmonically speaking, this is Haydn for himself. It starts. That's already a second phrase. That's an answer. Now, before I explain that further, and you believe me, it'll be very clear. We know that Haydn thought of it as an ending because it is the ending of a very silly little piece that he wrote. And let's hear that. This is a piece, uh, we would call it a hurdy-gurdy, but at the time, uh, the, the king of Naples played, he was a virtuoso <laughs> on the, well, you know, kings are always virtuosos. He was a virtuoso on the lira organizzata, which is like a hurdy-gurdy, but a little bit more complicated. A hurdy-gurdy, in case you actually haven't seen one, is really hard to play and not, almost, I don't know if it's worth it, it's hilarious. It has a crank, and as you crank it, the crank is attached to a round bow, like a violin bow, but round, and it plays on the strings, and the strings uh, are the stopping, instead of fingers, you're playing a keyboard, and the keyboard has uh, little stops going out of it. So it's like a keyboard and a violin, and you have to play like this, and it doesn't have a lot of power. Here's the very end of the concerto for two lira or lire organizzate and orchestra that Haydn wrote for the King of Naples.
Now, there it is. He also used that same ending, note for note, in, a, in a symphony number 89. And then he used it, in a, in a way, let's say at the end of this piece, uh, could you play for the coda starting at 150, and we'll just go, uh, I'll stop you. But let's, this is the actual end, not the beginning, of this same quartet. Okay, stop there. Now, it goes on, it, it does go a little further, but there you have exactly what you heard. Now, let's play the opening again. And you'll see that it goes wrong, but there's also a thing that goes wrong that you don't hear. <laughs> okay, let's hear that. Now, here comes the ending. Okay, see, he went the wrong way. It's supposed to go down. I'm sure he was rolling on the floor when he wrote that. <laughs> but not only is that funny, but what's really funny for Haydn is that the first phrase is missing. And he does this kind of thing quite a lot. I put it back. There's, this doesn't exist anywhere. So let's play the fake version that I wrote out for you. This is what he didn't write, and it's what I would call normalized. Do you know this? Uh, let's not make things normal, right? Okay. This is making this normal. That's the phrase you didn't get. You got that one. Now, that's totally normal, and it sounds like Haydn, but he never wrote that. <laughs> and he wouldn't have written that except for when he was very, very young, because it's too straightforward. Now, I want you to play the same thing, but stop after the one, two, three, four, fifth bar. Just play five bars, then we'll go back to the real one again. Okay, now the real one opens with the second phrase, but it also starts with twice as many notes in the cello. And the reason, which is very strange, the reason for that is he's left something out and he, he's kind of signaling that the opening phrase isn't there. Let's try it. Again. Okay, now remember how I ended it with the little triplets? Let's play the whole opening as, as he actually wrote it up until bar um, what are, 10 or 12. Okay, you see how there are these silences, and instead of writing a simple ba da 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 like, for, if this were really going to be acted, if this were going to be directed, by the way, you know, that's one thing that drives me crazy, that chamber music is never directed by a theater director. And I would like to do that. So we'll, we'll exp I think it would be great. Let's experiment. I, I mean, it is sometimes directed by a theater director, but with actors and everybody else. I mean, just the musicians and nothing else. So let's try. Your opening is already, I would be, and I, I wouldn't really do this in a performance, but you're actually worried by the second bar, because where are they? You see what I mean? Where are they? You're just going to play that one note for a very long time. Then when you come in, you know, you're playing the second phrase. I'm not sure what you do with that. But then when you have those silences, you need to feel less secure. And the sound maybe should be a little more like, where are we going with this? All right. Just try it. Good, yeah, and you know. <laughs> now, 
in, in a, I, what I would say is without all, without all the uh, visuals, which I think were hilarious, it should sound like that. You know what I mean? I don't usually hear it played like that, actually. I, I often don't hear uh, the composer's uh, humor played by almost anybody. It's usually missing. So if you think about that, go through the piece when you perform Haydn in general and look for the confusion. And if you can play it that way, it'll be, you'll become famous Haydn players. OK. <laughs> Except that there will be people who think you actually are confused. And that's why people are afraid to do it. OK. Now, there are already lots of little puns in there. But before I get to the puns, another digression. The business of starting with a pulsing note and starting in the middle of something was not invented by Haydn. Making it funny was invented by Haydn. It exists in a lot of music before Haydn where it's not funny. So here's an example by Bach. It's from a cantata where it's beautiful. And it's exactly the same idea because it starts on a, it's got a pulsing note in the bass. And it starts on a harmony that you don't know where you're going. And as it unfolds, it's the furthest thing from funny. What it is, is kind of, it has this kind of spirituality and depth of feeling coming from its ambiguity. on like that. It's exactly the same idea. It starts with a pulse. You don't know where you are. It's in the middle of a phrase, but it's not funny. Haydn somehow realized that that could be funny. Um, okay, so there are little puns in here too. Now, we, we know the big joke, but you know, Haydn, the details are also funny, and it's impossible to hear everything and do everything, but it's worth pointing out because, as I always say, this is a lecture, so I have to point out all this stuff. Okay, so... Uh, the first note that is not in the key, you know, this is, we're in B flat. The first note that is not in the key, who plays it? Anybody know? The cello goes, right? That note is an F sharp. And then what happens is the same note, very soon after that, is defined as a G flat. I'll show you what I mean. You have. And then you also have this. Same note, but this time it's flat. And then it's sharp again. So he's taking, and he does this a lot. He takes a note, it's just a little dissonance, but um, depending on the context, it's either an F sharp or a G flat, and it never goes anywhere. It's not accomplishing anything. It's just there as a dissonance. And the first one, as I say, is... If it's an F sharp, it's going to go up. And then if it's a G flat, it's going to go down. And then an F sharp, it's going to go up. So there are little tiny funny things. And um, if, let's see if you can play the F sharps and the G flats. There are, there's obviously B natural, but that's not, a, uh, it's not humorous. <laughs> um, see if we can make those stick out a little bit in a way that might get people to smile. Smile's good. You know, this may not be a laugh, but smile. Let's just see what happens from the beginning. Now, that's not the end of the piece, but it sure sounds like it. Of course, it would be a very short piece. That's the end of the, of the first little section. Now, Haydn, you know, didn't usually write a first theme like that and then a new theme. He just kept going with ideas. So everything in this whole piece is based on music we've already heard. 
Nothing new ever comes in except as an extension or elaboration of what we've already heard. The very next chord, the next, can you just play the next two bars for us that we're about to hear? Okay, those two bars, sorry, uh, this note is the F sharp again. That F sharp has come back. We had it here, we had it here. And once this new section begins, and what happens is the music gets more and more chromatic. In other words, more um, sharps and flats creep in to infest the whole thing and make it go through lots of modulations. Now, this is typical, but all of this, this whole idea of uh, playing with form and then saving the rich harmonic journey going through different keys for the middle of the piece, which is what he's about to do, sounds very typical, but he invented that too. I mean, the closest thing to it, you can find it in Bach, but you can find everything in Bach. So, I mean, I guess that's true. But in terms of a narrative structure, he was the first real narrative composer where the, p the story is contained in the music by itself. There's no text, there's no reference to anything, there's no emotional affectation attached to it, it's just the storyline. And the storyline has to do with how this little idea, number one, becomes an ending, which is very happy, <laughs> and number two, what journey does it take? And the journey is the journey of key change. Um, Haydn, all his life, composed every single day, and if he felt like he couldn't compose, he, did, he studied music and wrote exercises. Every day. He wrote about this a few times, and a few composers stopped in to see him, and he would tell them that they, they always had to interrupt him. And what's interesting is when he was 40, and again when he was 70, the same story is told by two different composers who went to see him, that they walked in to see him, and he was busy harmonizing a Scottish folk song, both times. And, and they say to him, why are you, you know, oh, Master Haydn, <laughs> Papa Haydn, why are you harmonizing the little folk song? And he said, there's always something to be learned by doing this. And, you, and he said, this great lesson in modulation to just make it as interesting as possible. He said that, you know, either this is a great story or between 40 and 70, nothing changed. <laughs> <laughs> but, so the journey that this goes on is quite extraordinary harmonically. Um, but we'll, we'll, let's, let's go right to the, the development section. Now, what is the development section? Really, you have to say it's the section where the most harmonic interest happens. Almost anything else may not be true. It could be true. Because sonata form, as I always say, is so not a form. It is not a form. Do you like that joke? I know, you've heard it before. Um, in my Haydn um, show for kids, which is coming up uh, November something, 11th, uh, I think. There's a Haydn show for kids where I play Haydn, and we have a, an, a Broadway comic actor playing Prince Esterhazy. Uh, I think you can still get tickets. And a lot of things are explained. For example, that opening, if you play a chord, that long, you don't have to play it now, that dominant seventh chord that you play for a long time, and then there's a chord. When do you start after the silence? We didn't talk about that. Actually, do you mind going back to that for a second? Because this is something else to talk about. And this applies to almost all Haydn. There, there are silences with fermatas over them, right at the beginning. And a fermata, if you're not familiar with fermata, means uh, a pause of indeterminate length. It's a, you know, a cur it looks like an eye. Oh, that's Victor Borga, right? So uh, that's not all that's Victor Borga, believe me. Okay, so if you start again with a very, very long chord, making it unbearably long, play the chord, but then don't start the piece where it feels like it should start, because there's a silence, and we don't know how long that silence is, right? So let's make the silence unbearable. <laughs> now, during this time, you're not playing yet, maybe the prince was eating potato chips. What was the prince doing? He was not actually ready to pay attention to the piece. So he might have been the only one in the audience, right? So they look at, look out at the prince. Is he ready? Look over there. Is he ready? No, he's not ready. You can't start yet. Now the prince is straightening his tie. Take a look at him. No, he's not ready. He sits down. He stands up. 
He's not ready. He's the only one in the audience that matters. He might even be the only one there. He sits down. He's, you're almost ready. He stands up. He sits down. You better start. Okay, good. <laughs> That's what it's like. And I think it may well have been that way because the prince was the royalty. He was sometimes and many times the only person in the audience because, you know, Haydn worked almost his entire life for the Esterhazy uh, princes. As they died and were born, he just stayed there writing music. And until the last one outlived Haydn, but, you know, somebody had to. Um, and so this, this idea of playing with the audience, how long do you hold something, when do you start, it may really be about having that kind of audience that is, is royalty, and you don't know how much attention they're actually paying. Now, let's look at the development section. The development section, and as I say, we've, we'll... we'll have done a lot of music before we get here, but now the difference is the harmonic interest opens up. It changes key a lot. Let's hear how it starts. Hold it! <laughs> <laughs> They're being very good sports. <laughs> okay, the piece started like this, right? Now it's going like this. We don't know what's coming, do we? Unless you actually know it. It could be... Or it could be, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Could be. <laughs> or it could be. <laughs> no. It couldn't be. That. <laughs> that would be make it Shostakovich, who takes Haydn and does exactly that sort of thing. Haydn, Shostakovich's whole technique is looking, I think, is looking at Haydn and uh, going in the keys that were forbidden and doing very similar structures. Okay, so let's hear what does happen. Okay, good. So, it's quite beautiful, and what's beautiful about it, really, is the, the way it changes keys. It is as sophisticated harmonically as music from the Romantic period, as Schumann, as Brahms, it really is, because Haydn saved his, his harmonic journeys for these spots, and since he was so great at setting all these Scottish folk songs, he really did know how to uncover unusual progressions. I would be hard put to find that chord progression anywhere. It's very unusual. Um, and what I mean by that is, th th it starts, it's not unusual at the beginning. We don't know what this is going to be. And he does do something very charming, which is, this is the root of the chord, but he also has the ninth. So it goes. Now, he might have learned that from Mozart. Could he have learned it from Mozart? Yeah, he could have. Because Mozart did that a lot. It's possible. He learned a lot from Mozart. What's great, though, is he does it quietly. So a quiet, dissonant chord has a different kind of feeling than it. Can you play that same thing, only come in sforzando piano on it? Yeah, now that is very romantic and dramatic. Now play it the way he wrote it, because it's really very, very different kind of mentality. Okay, so he's arrived at A flat major. We are in the key, the whole movement in this piece is in B flat. So he managed to go down to, it's actually very unusual. Um, but with Haydn, it isn't. Because with Haydn, he always does the unusual thing. But since he was one of the first people to write in these structures and these forms, how can it be that he does all these unusual things before there was us uh, usual? I'm really asking that, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
he, uh, he established something with his unusual uh, ideas. Um, I mean, for example, he has a string quartet that starts off in C major, and after some music, there's a big silence, and it just goes, just goes into A flat major. And when people didn't know Haydn so well, because he sort of disappeared from the repertoire for many years, when he was rediscovered by musicians, they were always saying, oh, look, this is an extraordinary, absolutely unusual piece. This never happens again until Brahms or Wagner. And then they find another one. Oh, here's a very, and then they found hundreds of these. They're all like that. There's like so many pieces that are unbelievably unusual. What he established was not these weird key changes, because if everybody did that the same way, it would, it would die out quickly, it wouldn't be very interesting. What he established was the idea of disruption and subversive activity within the piece. In other words, he established the idea that a form is working against itself. The he established the whole idea of how a narrative unfolds in music, story-like. The narrative unfolds with problems. The problems come in because of the unexpected. Therefore, they become expected, but you still know which ones, right? So it's like any good story, you're waiting to be surprised. You, if you're never surprised, it's a bad story. So how many surprises can there be? But the main point is that the element of surprise is so common in Haydn because he invented the concept. All right, I feel good about that. <laughs> um, so let's go a little further. So he gets to A-flat major. And he stays there for a little while, and then from A-flat he goes down to D-flat in a very nice way, which is, uh, it's a great moment where you hear that, that note when it comes in changes everything. Let's, let's back up to, um, looking for a measure number, 79, 78, 76, 75. Great. Now, that's quite a bit of the, of the uh, development. There is a pun in there that is not funny. Not every pun is funny. Believe me, some of them are terrible. No. <laughs> but this pun is only a pun in that it's musical uh, wordplay. It has to do, the musicians use the word enharmonic. Uh, just like in English, if you say T-W-O is two and T-O is two and T-O-O is two, um, they all sound the same but they're spelled differently because they have different meanings. And harmonic is exactly that. So for example, this chord, which you just heard a moment ago, um, and then here it's in the key of G minor, but it's also a chord we heard earlier in A flat. So it can do two things. It has two common resolutions. And For a composer, that is a great tool. And there are many things like that. This is, uh, the technical name for this is that the dominant seventh of A flat is an augmented sixth of G minor. Making it more uh, like a composer's tool, the um, A flat is called the Neapolitan of G minor. You don't have to know this, believe me. You don't have to know this. But there's probably somebody listening to this somewhere who's writing this down, and I'll get a letter about it. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, but basically, the augmented sixth chord sounds like the dominant of the Neapolitan. Okay, got it? So that means to, to Haydn that he can do that, and he can go. Now that stayed an exciting thing for a hundred years. Schumann, for example, was obsessed with this. He did it over and over and over in many, many pieces. He even has a piano piece that goes something like many times. And then one time. 
And you know, that's the same chord going the other way, and that's a delightful thing, and everyone smiles. It's the same pun that Haydn made many, many times. And of course, Bach did it too, but with Bach, it wasn't funny. It was spiritual. <laughs> I think Bach knew a lot about being funny, but um, not so much in his music. Although, he did write some, some funny music. It's true. Okay, now, <clears throat> we stopped at a really important place. The most complex compositional joke is about to happen, and it's so complicated that I'm not sure it's funny, but it is astonishing. It's so interesting. Because one of the main things that we listen for in a narrative sonata-like structure is the return of all the music. You've got the exposition where you hear, there's nothing wrong with calling something an exposition. I mean, you hear things for the first time. Then you have the development in which Things become harmonically interesting. Sometimes they become contrapuntally interesting. With Beethoven, they get taken apart, and usually a new thing emerges. But then you have the recapitulation in which things come back. And there are different kinds of recapitulations. There's the non-existent one that everyone always waits for. <laughs> that is exactly like the beginning. There aren't any like that except really trashy little pieces by second-rate composers. They, they don't do that. Mozart doesn't do it. Haydn doesn't do it. Beethoven doesn't do it. They do things that almost sound like it, but you're missing a lot if you just turn off at the recap and think it's the same. It's not the same. Haydn does the craziest recapitulations of anybody because he was the first one to really do it. So he established how weird it can get. And uh, in this case, the recapitulation seems like it's starting in the wrong key, so we, don't, we know that's not it. Then we realize it's happening but when did it start? We have to think, scroll back, because we missed it. He does this on purpose. Now, let's, let's start right where you stopped on this. OK. Okay, see, we, when you heard it, it stopped because it was actually the second phrase. Remember I told you the first phrase was missing? Well, he kind of has the first phrase here because, um, could you play bar 108? Okay, now that bar 108, that's actually where the recapitulation begins. But that's the measure he never did the first time. See what a wise guy this guy is? It's unbelievable. You should see, or maybe you shouldn't, all the musicological art articles with people arguing about this. It's hilarious. You know, they get to fly to Salzburg and they get put up for lunch and then, you know, they, they discuss this and they have a conference and then they go home and they come back and they. Anyway, but <laughs> basically, it starts right there. Uh, the cello has it even more. It sounds like an ending, but here. And then the second phrase is the first phrase, and it stops, and he goes on. He actually then cuts out 17 bars from the opening, and his recapitulation has some new musical ideas cu coming from the opening, but it also cuts huge amounts of music because he doesn't need it anymore. And there is something uh, brand new uh, starting at bar 121 to 123. Okay. Now, it sounds a lot like what we've heard, but he didn't do any of that before. And the only reason that's interesting is everything else in the recap comes from something at the beginning changed in some way, except for this. this is, he needs a new transition. Then we finally <clears throat> we get to what seems like an ending. Now, I want to take a look at the, that little phrase that's been bothering everybody, well, certainly me. Um, this phrase.
what we really want to hear eventually is, like you, you, you did here in the symphony, you want to hear it end and go here. Like that was what you heard in the hurdy-gurdy piece, okay? You do get this in the coda, but before you get it, you almost get it. You get this. But if he ends it there, he knows that you're going to think it's over way too soon. So let's see what happens. Let's, let's play it like with that cut. Because this is what would have happened had he not done one of his digressions. And we'll put the digression back and you'll see what I mean. So let's start at, uh, yeah, one, whatever it was, 140 or so? That's good. Okay, so you finally get an ending, but he knows that that's too soon, and he's been playing with endings the whole time. So he has to have another trick up his sleeve, and that trick is a completely unexpected digression. Let's play it the way he wrote it. Okay, so he avoided the ending by getting you upset, first making it uh, you know, sound quiet and strange and then suddenly loud, but you now you know we have to keep listening, it can't end like that. So he, he saved himself from that ending. Now, before we get to, well, we might as well. <laughs> so the ending does have, but he's so proud of that, he's so happy to get there, he's so pleased that he finally got there that he has to add something. And that something is harmonic. And, and also then, he gives you a very Mozartian cadence, a little phrase, which is this. That, you would know immediately, is an ending of like a little Mozart aria, right? Or even a big one. Because what it has is the ending note and then a reaffirmation. That is really an ending. We haven't gotten that until now. And we, right before it, we get, and then a little celebration, which is great. And then, so let's hear uh, from 150. This is the coda of the actual ending of this piece. celebration chord and cadence. Now, I didn't tell you about those triplets. Didn't they get you a little bit, right? Because if you don't expect them, uh, it's hilarious. Now, because you finally get that closing gesture, but instead of it ending, dum, bum, you, you get those triplets. Now, if you can make those triplets even more like you're laughing, you're so excited that you're home. Let's go back and do that one more time. I don't know what, use a laughing stroke. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> great, great. Now, I want to back up a little bit to the weirdest part of the piece, which you heard already, but it, it's the strangest moment. In G minor, in the, at the end of the development, right before it returns, we have this, right? And we don't know what's gonna happen. Is it gonna be, or is it gonna be? We don't know, but what it is, It's great. 
it's, you're not expecting that, are you? And it's not funny, uh, but it's an unexpected, it's the only unexpected serious thing in this first movement. It's an unexpected, painful little thing. So. What it is, is that this note is suspended into a normal chord. Here's the chord. But this note doesn't go away. And then it does. That's a suspension. They're very common. Um, in fact, it's called that because I think the note um, this misbehaves and is suspended for it. <laughs> no, no. OK. But anyway. Now, it reminded me of, in a Haydn sonata, this is an actual phrase by Haydn. And I say that because I played this once in a radio program, and I got emails saying, that is not, does not sound like Haydn. They thought I made this up. It doesn't sound like Haydn. It's way off. But it is by Haydn. So I'll just, I'll play, I'm going to play it for you. I didn't do anything to this. It's actually the same notes. Sorry. <laughs> You didn't expect that either, did you? So it starts off with this note. It's exactly, instead of that, it's, 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 almost, it's the same chord. And then it gets faster and faster. And then a big uh, dramatic measure. And then it resolves to Is this realistic? <laughs> I love that word because uh, it's, a, it's actually an interesting question to ask. How c it's realistic music, that's for sure, in that it is music and it's real. But it also is not artificial in the sense that he's just toying with you. Because this is what we do every day, right now, isn't it? You know, you read the news, you pick up, you, you pick up something to read, you start to read the news, you start to think about it. And then you think, I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> How much more realistic could it get? <laughs> sure. uh, but that's the point. That's really that's what makes Haydn so brilliant, is because we recognize the truth of it, even if it isn't articulated uh, in English, which he didn't speak very well anyway. Um, so before, before we hear the first movement played straight through, which we are, I just want to share a couple of little comments by some people about digressions. I regret that almost all novels ever written are much too obedient to the rules of unity of action. What I mean to say is that at their core is one single chain of ca causally related acts and events. These novels are like a narrow street along which someone drives his characters with a whip. Dramatic tension is the real curse of the novel because it transforms everything. Even the most beautiful pages, even the most surprising scenes and observations, merely into steps leading to the final resolution in which the meaning of everything that preceded it is concentrated. The novel is consumed in the fire of its own tension, like a bell of straw. This is Milan Kundera. Now, here's somebody else on the same subject. Digressions, incontestably, are the sunshine. They are the life, the soul of reading. Take them out of this book, for instance, and you might as well take the book along with them. Lawrence Stern, 1780. Nothing's changed. <laughs> okay, are we ready to play through that? Great.
So, my fellow Americans, good evening. <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> See you next time.